Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another edition of In Studio. I'm your host, Ted Perch, and today we are at Cottage Street Studio of Mike McTavish, and we're going to be talking about Impressionism and his own work and his Impressionist style. So welcome to the program, Mike. It's Thank you, Ted. good to have you here. Now, Impressionism, in, in kind of my opinion, is probably the most popular uh, uh, style that, that, people, that people respond to. Um, and the history of it is, 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 is essentially that in the 1870s or so, it was a revolutionary right. movement that was, uh, because the art world at the time in France particularly was, was locked into uh, the solid style of religious paintings and stage scenes and these massive paintings that were dark colored and, and yellow varnish. And, um, and along comes Monet and he, he does a painting called Impression, Solevant, which is sunrise, which proved to be, you know, really, really was the beginning of that movement. And uh, there was Monet, Manet, uh, Alfred Sisley, um, who, who else did, that, you can, that you can talk about who? Degas. Degas, uh, yeah, sculpture and, and his paintings. And the, it was a revolution because it caused a, uh, a real stir generally because it was it was uh it was art that was produced outside plein air they called it mm -hmm. it it was about color and light and uh atmosphere and uh bright bright colors yeah and also it was about um more about um day to day activities of regular people right. rather than the aristocracy and that sort of thing uh so i really that's one of the reasons why I gravitated to mm -hmm. that, besides my natural painting style kind of fit into Impressionism. And it was, it, so it was, it was the use of these bright, bright colors and that, was, that was really new and that, and that really, drew, really draws people in when you see even, even contemporary Impressionist style things. You, you, it, it's really electric and really dynamic. And we can get into mm -hmm. how, that, how you do that, how that's done. Well, like um, the other thing about getting outdoors is that this, the invention of the tube, you know, paint painting put into the tube allowed artists to go outdoors and manage painting, you know, outside of their studio rather yeah. than mixing up the paints and, you know, from powder and everything yeah, on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. You can't do that outside. You know, when you go yeah. outside painting, the light is constantly moving. Right. And you got to, you can't dally when you're Right, out you got to work quickly. Right, yeah, yeah. and that's part of impressionism. Is what's your first impression? You're looking around, you're trying to get excited about some part of nature, and um, there it is. And then you start painting, and within 10, 15 minutes, half an hour, the light changes. Right, it's a completely different scene. Absolutely. And, and, and I suppose your painting can change, or do you sort of stay with your initial impression? Well, that's one of the things that you learn, is that you don't follow the light. Ah. Um, as the day progresses, the, um, the light will change. Mm -hmm. And in some paintings, you might see that the shadow line is a different perspective throughout right. the day. So some artists will you know, pick up on that. But the thing is, is to really focus on your original concept and then paint it. And then at some point, you're painting from memory. And yeah. I find that a very compelling part of uh, yeah. outdoor painting. Yeah. So as you were saying, that uh, Impressionism, a lot of the technique is about uh, memory and using the fleeting effects of light. So, and one thing that was revolutionary, or is revolutionary about Impressionism is that it is a concept. You work from your perception, which was really new at the time, that most, a lot of artists mm -hmm. just work from stage figures or models and, and that sort of thing. But getting outdoors and trying to capture light and air and whatever your perception was at that moment was was really is, is really part of that particularly in plein air when you're outdoors exactly it's um you have to go with something in your mind in terms of uh, planning the, the composition everything like that mm -hmm. and as the day progresses you need to hold to it and i read somewhere that that uh, in, in, in part of the history of impressionism back then was that a lot of it some of the influence came from the works of constable and uh, J.M.W. Turner, two of my favorite artists, by the mm -hmm. way. But in the way they began to depict, they were working outdoors, or they began to depict landscape 
that, that, that started to become more diffuse and more impressionist. Of course, that was many, many, many years ahead, behind, you know, 1700s or so, but they, they, they were artists that set the stage as, it was, as, as, as time went by. Exactly, and um, in terms of how I interface with uh, Impressionism, came um, from artists who studied under Monet, and mm -hmm. in fact, there's an artist named Guy Rose who was a neighbor of, of yeah. Monet, mm -hmm. and uh, they painted together outdoors, and Rose picked up quite a few things from that. And then when he came back to the United States, he went back to California mm -hmm. and started this whole, he didn't himself start, but he got connected to uh, this whole movement of Impressionism in the United States, California Impressionism. And that's where I uh, really got in tune. There's one artist in particular called uh, Edgar Payne, mm -hmm. who was primarily self-taught, but and he wrote a book on composition of outdoor painting. Hmm. And I just, that was my Bible yeah. when I yeah, first yeah. started. Um, it just was amazing because he talks about the fundamental principles of what you were mentioning of going outdoors, finding a concept, you know, what can you do with nature because you can bend and twist and move trees around to help your composition. It's your interpretation. Your interpretation. And um, when is it going too far and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And there's all these different theories. And then there was compositional techniques of um, uh, serpentine uh, lines going into uh, a painting or yeah. there could be a C or um, an X or a zigzag. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just all these interesting things. And then the thing, too, is you then disguise those techniques within your painting itself. And um, that was very illuminating for me. And yeah. I think that really influenced me more than going to the French Impressionists right. themselves, personally speaking. Well, there was a whole, from, from the movement in France, there was a whole uh, import fr into you know, American Impressionism. American oh. Impressionism also has you know, established itself very solidly. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Cassette was one, um, uh, J. Alden Weir, and so forth. And there was, in Connecticut, uh, in Old Lyme, there was a school that existed for a long time in uh, the Florence, Florence Griswold was the host. Mm -hmm. And today you can go down to Old Lyme, the Florence Griswold Museum, and see a lot of their works. So mm -hmm. there, th these, th these different schools like you're, you're primarily influenced with Calif California Impressionism, which was a very strong movement. But all, all over the place, you know, Impressionism began to blossom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, that was, uh, th so that was kind of the effect of what was going on. Yeah, it sparked it just, artists' lives all over the place. Yeah, there even, was a... even John Singer Sargent, who was not considered a, an Impressionist, but some of his later works, you know, he, he, he moved into that a little bit. And... Uh, uh, there was a, recently there was an exhibition of his works in Boston, and mm -hmm. uh, you could see some of those works that were that were had moved away from his portrait style and some of his uh, Oriental paintings, and uh, he and he, he you know he was working with that as well. So mm -hmm. it, it really it impression has really influenced a lot. Right, there yeah. were times when um, Sargent would just go out and people would observe, and all of a sudden he would just sit down and just start painting. Yeah. And so in that respect, he was walking around observing nature and something grabbed his eye and he sat down. It wasn't anything particularly dramatic, right. but what he could bring to it was his wonderful style and brushstroke and his engagement and connection to whatever he was seeing. Yeah. And that, I love Sargent. He's just yes. an incredible oh, painter. Uh, yes. Yes. So. Um, now, you you're, you're have a very strong link to California Impressionism style. So, mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. Well, when I, I have different uh, directions that I went in my life, and um, 12 years ago I became uh, a full-time painter again. Before that, I was a expedition painter and weekend painter. And during the expeditions, we used to go down to my wife and I, Denise Herzog. Um, we would go down to Arizona or to California, and yeah. I would spend months painting down there. Yeah. And that was what, when I first started getting connected and bonding with Impressionistic painting. And I took a few workshops with, um, at the Scottsdale Artist School in turn, mm -hmm. really good contemporary Impressionist painters. 
who are very strong advocates of plein air painting. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to learn how, what this was all about, painting outdoors. You know, I pretty much painted in the studio before. And so I went down, and they have all these tricks and techniques of how to cope with painting outdoors. Yeah. Because, as I said earlier, the light is moving, and you can't, you got to, you know, deal with the elements. You know, wind can come up and yeah. all those sorts of things. And, and the light out west is just very different than it is here. Oh, yes. I mean, the, yes. the whole landscape is, you know, yeah, desert was, country, and this is all forested, and the light is just... It's very different. Yeah, and yeah. it's very uh, conducive for doing uh, impressionistic painting because you get that intensity. Yeah. And so you, so if you're out there trying to say, well, how do I get that? Um, you may start leaning towards going towards more primary colors. Right. And uh, dealing with the contrast between um, maybe heightening the contrasts of value. And one of the things um, that I'm interested in is relational exaggeration, mm -hmm. where you try within a painting, you elevate everything a little bit, the saturation, you elevate um, uh, color and, um, and value and temperature mm -hmm. to really kind of simulate the, the temperature and intensity of light outside, because it's 10 times brighter than anything really you can right, you know, right. deal with non-reflective sorts of medium. And so that was you know, where I kind of then just went outside and paint, 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 right. and picking it up. There was one thing that, uh, I was, uh, that I wanted to mention as you were talking about composition and so forth and color. Uh, I remember uh, reading about how the impressionists, the early impressionists were influenced a lot by uh, Japanese printmaking. And the, the composition of Japanese prints, several, you know, began to, that influence began to began to be seen in Impressionist paintings, how the, how the paintings were, were structured. And it, it's the kind of thing, you, well, you wouldn't know unless, unless it was pointed out, because it's, it's just one of those influences that got absorbed. And if you were, if you were in the world, then you, would, then you mm -hmm. would notice that. And the other, the other influence was photography. Yes. How, and, and how that, uh, now I suppose you, you, you can go out and you know, take some color photographs or black and white photographs of a scene. You can bring that back into the studio and work from that. Is, that's true for you, isn't it? Well, I, um, I do both. Mm -hmm. I um, do plein air studies, which, um, or sketches, which I don't then turn into paintings, but I have a whole um, bundle of sketches that I can um, you utilize mm -hmm. in different, uh, when I come back to the studio and develop a studio painting. Right. And when I do one of those, I will lay it on a flatbed scanner and scan it into the mm -hmm. computer and then start working with it further in Photoshop. So I don't actually paint from photographs. Right. I use them for uh, reference material mm -hmm. and I almost immediately turn them to black and white because right. I'm really looking for edge reference and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And I rely on my photos, um, my plein air sketches, more for color. Right. And like um, back in Turner's days, they might do outdoor sketching, and they'll write in mauve rose or something right, like right, that, right, yeah. and that sort of thing. So one day I thought, well, I'm I don't want to write these things. I just so I go out and I, rather than, you know, writing something in, I'll mm -hmm. mix up that dab of paint. Yeah. and just put it there as a reference and then I'll have a whole sequence of them all over the sketch mm -hmm. but I won't necessarily finish the painting um, there and I'll come back and right. develop a studio. A lot painting. of times th those, those marks are when especially for uh, it's the established you know the elite artist when they when they're trying to determine whether a painting is, is, is a, a copy or the original they'll x-ray them and sometimes you will see those marks the the letters or for different colors. It's almost like, uh, you know, paint by number. Mm -hmm. They have those marks all over them and then they can tell, well, that was his habit of doing that. Or, well, maybe someday he'll x-ray a painting of yours. Oh boy, like, there oh, there's are no marks some on there, surprises. So that, must be, that must be an original <laughs> McTavish. So it's, uh, because when I'm in the act of painting in the studio and I try um, to get back into a zone of painting, um, I work primarily wet in the wet, so that's uh, a la prima or just every... You use oil. I use oil paint, yeah. so it stays wet for a very long time, and yeah. that's one reason why I got away from acrylics, because I like going back and scraping and editing and constructing a right. painting. 
So getting back to your point, if someone does an x-ray of one of my paintings, they'll see trees being eliminated, yep, they'll see yep, them shifted sure. over, mm -hmm. they'll see you know, light changes, shadows moving you know, in any direction, right. um, just in order to make the composition better. Yeah. And when I'm in that zone, that's, it sometimes takes a while to get there, but nothing is wrong then because I'm, yeah. I'm the painter and so it's, I have all this information that I've studied mm -hmm. over the years and everything and I try and follow all the principles, but well, getting, now it's the painting in me. Yeah, and, well getting into yeah. the zone or into that flow, yeah. I, I have a friend who's a novelist mm -hmm. and he, he, he describes the same thing when he, when, he's, when he starts writing, he just goes somewhere else. And he's in whatever he's writing. He's in that world, mm -hmm. and everything else just goes away. And he's he's right there, and he just takes down what he's experiencing in mm -hmm. that zone. So you're describing the same thing. You're you're you're, you're painting mm -hmm. right. You're right there in that moment, do, doing that. Exactly. Like, um, and sometimes it takes a while to get there. Yeah. And so I'll be mixing painting on um, paints and colors on my palette mm -hmm. and just kind of you know going along I'll do a sky on the palette <clears throat> and then right. at some point I'll take the palette knife and lift it up and just smear it right onto the mm, cool. you know so it's like uh, there isn't a single color on like up here there's uh, I will go with a palette knife and it'll have a sequence of colors going yes. back yeah and there's one painting on the other side of the room where um, I had done a lot of detail into marsh grasses and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And <clears throat> it's a skyscape, so it was beginning to compete with the sky. And um, so I'm in the zone, and I'm trying to figure out, this isn't working. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's not working. Yeah, right. And there was a, a, a seven, I have a seven-inch palette knife. Yeah. And I just <laughs> grabbed it, and I just went one Swish. swipe all the way across. It's a, you know, five-foot yeah wide painting yeah. and my eyes just bugged open because yeah, it was yeah. the beginning of the solution of what I needed to do. It softened the edges, the marshes mm -hmm. in the water, it looked like the tide was coming in yeah. and wow, you know, that's great and that's how I like to paint is being somewhat on the edge and then being in that zone. And, and, and you have to be willing and able to kind of take that risk. Oh yeah. If you're looking at something and you're thinking, well, this no, this is not right, but I'm not sure what is what right. is going to happen here. Exactly. And you just pick, like you say, you pick up that knife and you just change yeah. it. You deconstruct it and you change mm -hmm. it and and then you can change it again if it's not, you know, you can just keep going yeah. until something until you pull something out of there. Yeah, when you get tentative, you'll fall in love with a passage and you want to keep yeah. it and you start painting all around it and everything yeah, yeah. like that and it gets you know, it just will get mucked up and right. that sort of thing. So you really, nothing can be precious. And my wife will come in and she'll see the painting and leave for, you know, two hours or something like that and come back and she'll just be shocked because I'll eliminate some it's completely different. wonderful thing that won't yeah, be able yeah, to be yeah. seen until someone x-rays my painting, you know, yeah, you know yeah. years down the road if that ever happens. Yeah, that, that deconstruction process is, is, is really kind of important, particularly if it you're is. working on something that's, you know, doing a painting is actually just a process. It's not you know, it's not immediately mm -hmm. the, the view that you want to uh, present. And I've done that mm -hmm. too. I just, I look at things, no, that's not it, but I'll just, I'll just do this. And, you know, it changes it and, it, and back and forth until it, mm -hmm. until something falls into place. Or sometimes nothing, it, out it goes. Right. It's Start an educated or controlled accident. And yeah. sometimes wonderful things, accidentals happen. Yeah. And I'll work around that. When I did that first stroke, I only allowed myself like very limited re-entry into that because I didn't want to kill the energy that was generated yeah, yeah. from that. And that's part of Impressionism too, is that with, uh, with the broken brush strokes and that sort of thing, you can create a sense of movement. And when you're outside painting, that's one thing you notice. There's wind blowing, there's the water rippling. And I think the Impressionists really wanted to capture that in some way. So with and the short, with the short yeah, with brush broken strokes, brush really strokes, you get this kind of visual vibration yeah, going yeah. on, and I really think they were tuning into that, and mm -hmm. and that's something that's very important to me is like, uh, and the, how you deal with the edges and breaking up the color, and how you apply uh, the brush stroke will create some of that right. that you, energy. You want to you want to create that energy. Yeah, that, a sense that of wind. People. Yeah, otherwise it just right. lays there. It's like yeah. Huh? Well, like a lot of photo, like in photography, it's oftentimes, you know, just a, a frozen 
situation. You know, it's just very beautiful in itself. Yeah. But I think the Impressionists were very much interested in capturing the energy that's going on. Right. You know, the, the waves rolling and that sort of thing. You know, like up here, there's, right. you know, a lot of different brush strokes kind of simulating that movement and jostling back and right. forth. It draw, and it, wave. Yeah. The, the energy draws you right, me, it draws me right in like, I, I, like I'm there. Yes, and yes, I'm feeling yes. the wind, and I'm and, and, I, and I'm experiencing a color, and I'm I, I can smell the salt air, and and sometimes it's sometimes I get where if there if there are people in there, you can you can almost wish that they were moving, you know, kind right, of like alive. Yeah. You can sort of get the scene, um, particularly a lot of yeah. the, the, the the city scenes, like you mentioned before in Paris, and mm -hmm. some of those paintings where the, they're out in the park, and 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 everyday scenes of people, and you. You can almost hear them talking and, and go back to that time, you know, it's just... It, right, and then when you walk up to the painting, you get up close and you realize, it's these aren't people at all, these are just little dabs, little of, dabs paint of color here, and in how they do are, that, and as you move back, yeah. they become people, they become crowds, and yeah. it's just very fascinating. Yeah. It, and, you know, developing those techniques to be able to apply paint and... Um, Give some type of simulation of what what's out there. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's the excitement of painting for me. And I like using texture to generate that action. Yeah, that texture energy. is really a, really like, important. Now. And most painters like um, that I are really compelled to look at. They reveal their brush stroke, and mm -hmm. they have texture in their painting, and you can kind of see where what was going on in their head at the time when they yeah. were doing, because you see the brush stroke there, and then when you step away, it becomes, you know, a recognizable, representational scene. So, you were, you, we were talking about how, some part of your process about how you, when you lay down the color and you're in a zone, and you, some, at some point, you step back and look at things, and um, so there's some part of, there's an emotional connection to, to this, all of this as well, because uh, if you weren't emotionally connected to what you were what you were putting down, the paint would just lie there like a blob, and, right. and really wouldn't have any wouldn't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. So, in your in your process, you're you're really thinking and bringing some part of your emotional experience either with the scene that you were that you were connecting mm -hmm. with when you started, exactly. or other other parts of your life that 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 go into it that you exactly. interpret. Yes, and when you're in that zone, you're drawing from all those resources. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that happens with me when I'm painting is that um, I don't paint shapes or things anymore. Mm -hmm. There's this whole, and it becomes light, and it's, I'm painting light and shadow. So like uh, when you were talking earlier about Japanese prints and things like that, there's uh, all these big shapes that define uh, a yeah. composition and a right. painting. Well, oftentimes I'll do um, a composition where I'm not laying out um, shapes of things. I'm laying out shapes of light and shadow. Yeah. And I, that's kind of a background thing in my painting. Mm -hmm. And that, I, that's where my emotions get connected to. And I'm thinking at that level where um, the intensity of light really speaks to me. That's where my optimism comes out. That's yeah. where the energy and I try and bring the brush stroke to you know, simulate that sort of thing, like light bouncing off the water or um, different types of... You're bringing of, a whole spiritual dimension to... Exactly, what yeah. And, and, and outdoor painting is uh, very ephemeral, and light is just so transient and mm -hmm. moving, and to try and capture that in some way is, uh, is a spiritual experience. Oh, yeah. And when you feel like you do that, then that's when you know you got a successful painting. And you're really, you're really keyed into yeah. something that's really, that connects us all. Right. Which is probably yeah. why when people look at Impressionist paintings in particular, there's, they're, 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 they connect with that through themselves because there's some part of themselves in there. Yeah, it's almost like uh, with Impressionism in general, uh, you come back, uh, someone looks at a painting, and they'll see that intense light quality. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully, I think many artists hope that they connect to the viewer who's had those sorts of experiences. Right, and that's right. a way of 
um, being moved by a painting is what's going on here? Why am I being attracted to this painting? Yeah. And oftentimes it's light, and they may it may conjure some kind of memory that they had in a similar location right. where the lighting was just so for maybe ten seconds. Yeah. You know, like a sunset, and there's always a magical moment where oh, it's just absolutely beautiful, and then a cloud can come in and totally right. change it to be a dead and flat I, scene. I was just thinking sometimes, not sometimes, but I, I I'm imagining that artworks that people have in their home are, are they, they, they acquire them for that reason because every time they walk through a room they see that painting or they see that painting mm -hmm. and, and there's you know it re either reminds them of something in their life or it gives them inspiration or there's this there's generally kind of an uplifting quality like an optimistic kind of quality to things mm -hmm. and we all need that right you know, it's something that we need to have surrounding us and we surround ourselves with that because it's important Right. I had a collector that came back and told me that sometimes he just turns off the TV and he just, yeah. you know, looks at my painting and it, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a form of meditation for him. It yes. moved him to be able to get back to that place, that, that place of center and being connected to nature for him. Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, got him to purchase the painting in the first place, he right. can go back there and see that. And it's not like... Um, continual movement of images. It's just a fixed image that you meditate on and then you can think about whatever you know yeah. moves you and or get into a spiritual sort of realm Absolutely. to center yourself. Yeah. I was telling you before that one of, one of my favorite artists is uh, Turner yeah. and he in one of his uh, storm scenes uh, he has in the middle of the painting there's a, there's the sun. After right. the storm everything's clearing but it's still obscured somewhat and it, it and the sun in, in the is this bright light? Yeah, yeah. And it's 300 years later. Yeah. That 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 little dot. It's not a little mm -hmm. dot, but that quarter-sized dot in that painting is so intense. And I look at it, and it just sucks me right in. And mm -hmm. and and I and I was I always marvel at how he accomplished that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, th this color. It's white and a little bit of yellow, uh, and so forth. But it's just so intense. I mean. He had to intend that. He had to know that that was going to happen. And you were talking about how, well, what surrounds that is what also brings, what also, you know, uh, contributes to that intensity and brings it right out. Mm -hmm. And every time I see that painting, and I, I think it's down at one of the Yale uh, galleries in New Haven, mm -hmm. uh, every time I go and see that painting, I stand there just like transfixed because it's just. Zzzz. Yeah, we can think. And the other thing, yeah. I, I, was, I was talking before that uh, we were talking about. Uh, color and so forth. I was in Chicago and at the Art Institute and they had a, uh, a Monet exhibit and one of the paintings was there and it was all by itself on the wall in a small gallery. It was one of the water lilies and uh, it was the green and the blue mm -hmm. and it was just sitting there and there's a bench in front of it and I sat down and I'm, and it didn't take long before it starts vibrating in my head and it starts vibrating and not, not long after that, I had tears in my eyes. I was sitting there crying mm -hmm. because it was so intense and it was whatever it was speaking to me, it, 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 was, it, was, it was just there. And the beauty of the scene yeah. and the color and the whole thing was just, it was just trans, it was a moment that I, mm -hmm. that I still remember very vividly. And I was like, oh, this is yeah, wonderful. Think, yeah. This is what art does. Yeah, there was, a, I think, a museum in France or something like that, and they set up those huge paintings of water yeah, lilies, yeah. and it brought tears to some of the curator's eyes when Monet would come around, because oh, he imagine. would come in and he wanted to start working on them again, yeah. and they had, they're already hung, they're in a museum, no, no, and everything. No, no, you can't touch them. But that's, you know, an artist, you know, he's just... It's never, he, it's never finished. It's never finished, you know, there's always something more that you can urge it along, and, yeah. and um, that's... The beauty of painting is that you can um, create that kind of energy sometimes, and communic And when you can communicate it to someone else, and yeah. like when I do open studios, there's an opportunity where um, people come in, they look around the room, and say, "Oh, look at the light, you know, or the color. It's really exciting." That happened to uh, me when I at one yeah. when I first moved here. I came to the uh, the, one, the open house, and I and your door was open, and I walked in, I looked around, I said, "Oh, yes." Oh, thank you. Said, oh, yes, because all, all the paintings were here and just surrounded by this light and the color. Yeah. And it was winter time, but it, it just it just brought just brought me to wherever they take you, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just surrounded by this lovely light and the color that was just so 
It was, yeah. it was just so, it wasn't soothing so much, but it was, that energy was there. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, great, you know, this is wonderful. And I, th I think I mm -hmm. actually said that. I said, oh, Mike, this is just wonderful. Right, yeah. And uh, having all this, you know, doing this. And now that we're kind of evolving, heading into a kind of a dark season here. I find people will buy paintings like this so that they can get through the winter. Yeah. Or they can go back and see a little, you know, intensity of light. And, you know, I remember, you know, the, you know, summer and spring and that sort of thing. And, yeah. and I also find that I sell winter scenes more during the summer because as it gets further away, you know, right. you know it becomes more endearing. Well, you know, when it gets hot and humid, we're, we're, <laughs> we know, want we're to just cool dying off, right? because we want, we want to cool off. And you look at something that's cool in a winter scene, it's like, oh, yes. Yeah. And of course, in the winter, we want it warm. So we, so we, we go the opposite direction, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's great to have the opportunity to um, ha open our studio to uh, the open studios. Yeah. Like we have this open studio twice a year, uh, once during um, uh, June, first week of June. Mm -hmm. And well, actually, it's now connected with uh, uh, cultural chaos. Right. Whatever that happens, we, we connect with that. And then also during the winter, which is coming up December 5th. Sixth and right. seventh. It was important to mention that uh, the first weekend in December, December fifth, sixth, and seventh, and also on December thirteenth, the following weekend, here in Cottage Street is open studio. Uh, there will be what fifty-seven artists 50 or so. Most of the studios will be open for people to come and wander through and browse and hopefully uh, do some holiday shopping. And uh, it's a wonderful experience because a lot of times you come here and you know people are working their doors are closed or not here. But this is an opportunity to come and see what is happening in, in downtown East Hampton. There are probably over 200 studios here out and, out and around town. And most of the time, you don't really get to see uh, what's going on or you drive by and, and you have no idea what's going on. But there is some marvelous work going on here. So once again, the first week in December, the 5th, 6th, and 7th here at Cottage, uh, Cottage Street Studios at an open house. And you are also going to be hosting uh, Black Birch Winery yeah. on Saturday, December 6th, right. sometime in the afternoon. We haven't set up the, right. the hours yet. But I thought that was a good wedding between uh, wine and, and painting. And Impressionism seems to be a good mix somehow. There's Coming a, from France, wine country, the whole yeah, thing. Right. Yeah, right. And, uh, and also getting into um, seeing things a little bit differently. You know, a little bit blurred vision is, you know, <laughs> can be helpful. <laughs> You know, I have yeah, some artist friends who their eyesight is not that great, and they yeah. find that as a real asset for doing, you know, yeah, this type of thing. There's a lot of thing. stairs in this building, so yeah. you've got to be careful with that. But That's uh, true, and yeah, they'll be stairs. But, it's a, it, but it's, it's a great experience to come and just, yeah. and just wander around, because it really does open up a lot of things, and you get to meet people and talk yeah. to the right. artists and talk to you and, and so forth. And, and there'll be other artists in the building that will be connected with different food venues, too. Like food. And Feed so that, them and they will come. That's right. And, um, and that's always been a concern. You know, the building can be hot and cold in different places, right. and it's a huge complex. In fact, There's five a lot floors, of the ways so. I find out about some of the artists in here, I listen to in studio to find out what's going on. There's artists oh, all really? over the place. Well, you seem to be that's great. Thank you know, you. getting quite a few. I never really them. know. We, we never really know, you know who's watching. Or what but it's very audience, informative, so. and I really yeah. enjoy your program. Um, so anyway, there's going to be food venues and that sort yeah. of thing. So it should be a very good event. And as I said, there's going to be over 57 artists here, five yeah. visiting artists. And so there's, it'll be pretty exciting. And you don't get that anywhere else. I mean, that concentration of people that you can go from studio to studio and see many different things. Sculpture, yeah. there's painting, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of stuff. So um, make it a point of, of coming down because at least one of those days, it's a, it's a whole weekend. And you can't you can't go wrong. Now the last thing I wanted to ask you about okay. is uh, where is impressionism as a style headed? You know, it started a hundred years ago, and it's and it's gone through all sorts of permutations, and different artists and so forth have have come and gone and made their contributions to moving the style along or on to some other level. Uh, is there is there you know is it, is impressionism kind of moving? Evolving into perhaps another another uh, branch of its tree or another style. I think that impressionism has, as a big movement, has played itself out and really communicated mm -hmm. um, 
a wonderful body of work yeah. and where Impressionism is going now in terms of the concept. And I think it's like a seed and artists in different uh, areas will pick up segments of it and, mm -hmm. and go off with it. Like in this, the plein air movement down in the southwestern United States, yeah. I think, was very much influenced by Impressionist painting. And that's going on right now. Yeah. And it's very exciting stuff. And they're rediscovering some of the things and, uh, that went on in the French Impressionist period. And I just think that is the direction it's going. There'll be artists here and there that will just go to a museum and just fall in love with the painting and right. say, I, that's my springboard. I got to go right, from right, there. Yeah. So it's going to just pop up here and there. It's my, yeah. uh, my education. Well, plein air <laughs> especially because it's something that anyone can do. You can get Absolutely. your easel and you can go out. You don't have to have a lot of equipment. You don't really have to have a studio. You can go out and plop yourself down and, uh, and, and make, your own, make your own art. I know here here in this area there's a uh, plein air weekend uh, as part of ECA perhaps, but uh, where they have a contest and people go out do a painting and then and then I'm glad you brought everything that is up. collected up yeah. and you know you get to you get to see what people have done. Yeah, the Nash Gallery. Nash Gallery that's sponsors. Um, that's it. Um, a week paint out. Right. Paint where out. all these group of artists that paint outdoors will get together and they'll bring in their canvas mm -hmm. that's blank. And then they have the backside stamped, so it's they're officially in, they're, in they're the officially in, and they haven't done any preliminary painting, right. and so they're going to go out, and you have a week to yep. go out painting within the city limits of uh, East Hampton. Yeah, if you, and if you go around, you, you do see people parked in different places on the Absolutely. sidewalk and uh, ev everywhere. And it's an opening that I really encourage you to go to because yeah. all the artists who have spent that week painting mm. are there. Yeah, and it's an opportunity to really ask questions right. and see what's going on. They'll be more than happy to talk about their and painting. It's all local folks, and you get to it meet is. your neighbors. And That's right. Make friends, and it's a social event as well. Yes, and builds community. Absolutely, builds community. Yeah. yeah. So that's now that was in the spring, right? Or well, summer? usually no, it's in September generally. Oh, well, that was what, September. This is November. In fact, so. it yeah. just just it happened. Just happened, and then. Um, which is, I think, the later part of September. Yeah. But, um, but it's at the Nash Gallery, and you can just go to their website, and I think right. uh, you can find out. And Nash exactly. Gallery is another, is another venue. Uh, she always has uh, different paintings uh, displayed and openings there. And it's right up the street here on Cottage Street, right in the middle of the block. And uh, it's a great place to go, and it's a very social place, and it's a good community uh, um, it's a good part of the community. Yeah, she represents a lot of local artists, many people yeah. in this building. And so it's just a great way to go in and just see what's going around on around town creatively. Yeah. And she does a wonderful job of, you know, running that gallery and and I think that one problem for many people is dealing with price points with paintings. Oh yeah. And um she is one of the few galleries that represents me mm -hmm. who will deal with layaway painting. Yeah. You know, the price, um, not layaway painting, but layaway pricing scheme yeah, for yeah. painting where mm -hmm. you can just put a modest amount of money down. Yeah. And then you can come back and chip away at it over a, year, a period of a year or something like that. Yeah. But it secures the, the work for you and, and you can right. come back and visit and it kind of extends the whole pleasure of the purchasing experience. Right, go back you and know. look at it. Pay yeah, a little more and yeah. Keep go back and yeah, look at it again, and that's some then you point can decide, the magic oh, number. Do happens. I really want this? Can I have my money back? I yeah, changed my mind. Yeah, well, that is something about yeah. layaway that I've always I do that out of my studio too, and I always say that's fine. Yeah. But it's never happened yet. There's yeah. something that happens. You get you bond to the painting. I had a, I had a, an experience once when someone wanted a painting of mine. God knows why. Mm -hmm. But I, and I remember telling him, well. Keep it for six months. I'll just, right. You could just take it for six months, hang it, and you know, have your experience with it. And if it's something you really feel strongly attached to, then we'll talk about mm -hmm. purchasing it. But until then, you know, it's just why not just live with it for a while and to see if it really does speak mm -hmm. to you after a while. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you see something and like, well, it spoke to me then, but right now, you know, now it's it, I'm, I'm past that or something. But right. so this kind of thing is good because you can look and you can go back and. Yeah, yeah, I also yeah. do commission work, and um, oh, yeah. and 
one of my policies is that you don't have to buy the painting. Right. It's going to be a painting that I can regardless. sell regardless. Yeah. And that's how I'm going to approach it. And I may not paint exactly what you want to see. You know, I, or I the way you want to see it. Or the way you want to see it. Yeah. But I give you that option. Mm -hmm. You can just step back and that's fine. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but there's something mm -hmm. about that, you know, just relaxed, you know, approach that I think brings a comfort level to, yeah. you know, the, you know, either the sticker shock of first seeing a painting or yeah, something like that. Oh my just, God. Yeah. But my paints, my paintings are pretty uh, yeah, accessible. Sure. I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I'm, I assume so, so. Yeah. Well, Mike, thanks very much for coming on the program well, and talking about your me, work Ted. and really impressionism in general. And it's been, a, it's been a great discussion, and I hope everyone has gotten something from it. And once again, uh, Open Studios, December 5th, 6th, and 7th here at Cottage Street. Um, Mike's studio is on the third floor. It's actually right up the stairs, and it's, it's very accessible. And you can come in and see his work and talk to him, and you can wander around the building and talk to uh, lots of other people. So that's the uh, first weekend in, in December. So from all of us to all of you, I'm Ted Perch, and I'm still your host. And Mike McTavish, it's been great to, to have you here. And Thank it's you. It's been fun. So until next time, we'll see you again on In Studio.